Today on TechNado, we're talking with Joachim Sunberg of Baffin Bay Networks. We're going to look at a couple of operating systems dropping 32-bit support and find out about a compromised router that will not be patched. That's all coming up on TechNado, starting right now. Hello and welcome to TechNado. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, joined, as always, by Don Pizzette and Justin Dennison. How you gentlemen doing? I'm doing well. Don didn't stab himself, so I don't know how the show's going to go. I know. I'm a little distracted today because I'm focusing on growing my beard out. Yeah. And it's going great. Yeah. If you concentrate real hard, it'll go faster. Yeah, yeah. We, we do have a, uh, a guest today, uh, Joachim <laughs> Sundberg, uh, joining us uh, from Scandinavia, and you know the beards over Scandinavia. there. Scandinavia. Well, it's a, it's a region. Oh, it's oh. Uh, got it. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, he's from Sweden. There we go. Part of Scandinavia, which is part of, of Europe. The North Our Shield. People. Which is part of the Northern Hemisphere right. <laughs> and, and the Earth. Yeah. I'm from sorry Asgard. I wasn't as specific <laughs> as I, I could have been there. but uh, That's not a country. Yeah, I've never heard of that place. Uh, but his beard is fantastic, and, and we'll get to that um, definitely. And, and we'll probably talk about that mostly uh, as well as uh, he's with Baffin Bay Network, so we'll talk about uh, their threat protection uh, solutions as well that they have to offer. But uh, before we get to that, we're going to do some news. Uh, so our first article is over at uh, Petri.com. Uh, Microsoft unveils battery-powered version of Azure that fits in a backpack. And you know, this is one of those where it's great to have the, the layman on this show uh, <laughs> to say, what? Because my understanding uh, of Azure is that this is a, a cloud platform. It's, uh, you know, banks of, of computers that are put all across the, the world and we're able to, to put our, our data there. Is, is this just like a... a, a Got a little Wi-Fi hotspot, and it's that's my data's running around now. Well, so you know, let's think of the the number one weakness of the cloud, right? How amazing and excellent do your cloud services work when you have no internet connection? Not 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 great. Not not at all. At right? all. Even. Yeah. <laughs> so so what Microsoft is saying is there are certain scenarios. They're edge cases. This is not for the normal customer. But there are certain scenarios where somebody might want access to an Azure service but not be connected to the internet. And an example they give is, uh, you know, that you might be doing search and rescue and you're out in the middle of the woods and you are, you know, searching for somebody and you want to do some of their language translation software or processing images, right? You're, you're catching images of people in a crowd and you're trying to do facial recognition to find a particular person. Those are things that there are Azure cloud services that do, and they do it really well. But if you have no internet connection, you can't access them. You can't use that. And so what they've done is they've created a small piece of hardware, which they show a picture of. It looks like a it looks like an Intel NUC, except it's got SFPs on it. But uh, it's a, a, a tiny, small little computer that is uh, ruggedized. It meets the 810G ruggedized standard, so it's got little rubber bumpers on the corner and all that. It's designed to run on a battery, although they they were very coy about not saying how long the battery life was. So it will run for a certain amount of time on a battery and it comes allow with a you... 200 foot cable. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> keep letting it out. In theory, you know, you could take this backpack and or, you know, just really the server and, and go wherever and have access to those services while you're offline. And then when you come back, you just upload your data into the cloud where it needs to be. Uh, so you're allowed to take a piece of Azure with you while you're offline. Oh, that's that's sweet. I, if it makes you feel any better, Peter, I thought this was a joke. I thought it was a hoax. I was like, ah, just because it for some reason April that, yeah. that that picture looks very infomercialish. <laughs> you know, right? So I expected the four by three black bars on the side of this photo. This looked like it was taken with a Kodak Looking in the nineteen eighties. Yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, I tell you, it's good stuff. <laughs> Let me show you. Yeah. So it, for those of you listening, it is a gentleman with one of those like bumper mics, like the ShamWow guy. He's mm -hmm. in a, a suit, but he's got a, a military backpack in front of him, and he yeah. has a big old smile on his face. Yeah, and he's got that kind of grayish skin tone that only cameras in the 1980s were able to perfectly capture. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, I, and I thought this was more of a, uh, a device where you could still connect or uh, be backing up data or something remotely, and I couldn't think of a use case for that. So this makes a lot more sense now. And uh, Don, have you gone out and, and, and purchased one yet or pre-ordered? One, I got two. I mean, you gotta have redundancy. <laughs> battery runs out. See, I've got the I've got the AWS Messenger bag. Uh, uh, so yeah. it's very different. Yeah, yeah. And the 
the Google. Uh, I got the GCP um, paper bag. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> just, just, just a lunch bag. It was, it was, was that a Trader Joe's joke. bag? Yeah, it's a wet paper bag, uh, but it is eco friendly because yeah. it's reduced, reuse, recycle. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. Um, our next article is over at techradar.com. Uh, Mac OS Catalina is here. Everything you need to know about Mac OS. 10.15. They have all the details here, but the big detail I want to know is: Will it work with an external monitor and a so, docking station? So, um, the the tentative answer or the, the basic answer is we don't know because mm -hmm. Apple seems to break external monitors with every release, especially the ones that rely on Display Link. So I don't know if that works or not. Uh, but macOS Catalina, which was announced a couple of weeks ago, did go live uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, I know I've upgraded the machine behind me here that is doing the extreme heavy lifting job of displaying a slideshow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, is upgraded to it. We've upgraded several other machines here in the office. Uh, pretty smooth process. But there is a whole new permission scheme inside of macOS Catalina that you need to be aware of that will at least temporarily break a number of applications. So, for example, uh, I use VNC as a remote screen viewer. There's a new permission you have to grant to allow an app to do screen recording. And so your VNC or splash top or jump desktop or whatever application is used for remote screen viewing it might work fine under mojave and then the moment you upgrade up to catalina it's broken until you go and add those permissions in and now it starts to work again so make a make a stop by the uh, uh, privacy and security system preference panel and you'll see those new permissions listed and they're, they're for all sorts of things like bluetooth microphone access and so on so a lot more restrictive of what those applications can access and, and then the, oh, go ahead. the other big thing that you need to be aware of is this is the first version of Mac OS to eliminate support for 32-bit applications. So Apple has been warning us about that for years. This one is the one that finally dropped it. So now you 64-bit applications, the only thing that will work under Mac OS Catalina. And uh, I think we should take a moment uh, of silence because uh, iTunes... Oh, gone. yeah. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, no, I'm sorry. I just got a notification if I'd like to install a, an iTunes update. Yeah. <laughs> you? No, but I'm, I'm, right. I'm Catalina. But uh, I will tell you, there are, I can't, it's at least twice a week where iTunes opens and I go, oh, yeah, I did push that button yeah, that oops. iTunes went, oh, you mean to open me? No, that's not. Did not I mean that at all. Stupid touch bar. I did, haven't meant that in years. Did you <laughs> see any of the uh, the the outrage articles? Because anytime a new anything of comes course. out these days, the media looks for somebody who's outraged, and uh, the outrage group this time, DJs. <laughs> so apparently, there's a lot of DJs that rely on iTunes or use other software that taps into the iTunes database using an XML file they used to export. Well, that's gone now, and there's an API, but even the API is a temporary thing. Apple said so. DJs are basically losing all these playlists and stuff that they had built up over or, the years. Or, bear with me, don't upgrade yet. Well, that is a possibility, but Apple said I it mean, should just work. But here's the thing. Catalina's been harassing me for like the last three days. Like, <laughs> like they're like, listen, are you ready to upgrade? I'm like, not yet. It's like, well, when now? do you want us to upgrade? How about now? <laughs> yeah. How about now? It's, <laughs> it's like a, a couple of kids in the back of a car on vacation. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, I've just gotten- Are we there yet? In yeah. the morning, you know, it, it's a- just a, a reflex, a muscle memory to yeah. hit install tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't. Yeah, I don't even know what they're asking anymore. Uh, John, have you? Uh, I know you're you're a big iPad uh, Pro mm -hmm. user. Are you going to do the sidecar thing where you can use it as an external monitor? You know, the sidecar thing is pretty cool because I I use almost a, got a touchscreen now on a Mac. Well, so I actually use an application called Duet Display. Okay. Uh, which does the same thing, and it's been but around. It's a third party. It's a third party yeah. thing. Yep. And you know, you could hook up with a cable, and so you get super low latency and all that. Uh, and it's one of those things that would break every time Apple would upgrade the OS. So hopefully this time, uh, now that it's built into the OS, it'll be something that sticks around. But yeah, you can set that iPad Pro next to, or really any iPad. Well, you could set the iPad Pro in front of your other screen, and duct tape it on, <laughs> touch screen, or take put that it surface. on a door hinge, and then you could flip it open. Oh my God. Life hack. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yep. Uh, you know, another feature that I haven't had a chance to take a look at yet is uh, Mac OS Catalina is supposed to include support for developers where they can write a iOS application or an iPad OS application and just check a little box to have it compile for Mac OS as well. So we're supposed to see 
iOS apps make the jump over to macOS, but it's not like you can just go in and install them right now. You got to wait for the developers to do that cross compile. So we should see the macOS app store start to actually have some apps in it, not just the collection of tumbleweeds that are there yeah. now. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> or well, Xcode. You mentioned uh, you mentioned 32-bit. Uh, our next article uh, talks about that a little bit more over at ZDNet.com. Fedora drops 32-bit Linux uh, with the next version of Fedora support for obviously 32-bit uh, version of Linux will be dropped. So uh, it looks like Apple's not the only one uh, making that move now. Yeah, a, a number of operating systems have announced it. Uh, Canonical announced it with Ubuntu not too long ago. They said they were going to drop 32-bit support, and uh, a number of video gamers went nuts. That was the outrage group on this one. Uh, and Steam uh, from Valve, Valve Software? Yeah, it's Valve. Valve. Uh, whatever they're yeah, called, yeah. Valve. Uh, you know, they're the number one video game marketplace on the uh, uh, on PC. Uh, they basically said, "Look, uh, if you're going to drop 32-bit support, we'll just move our application over to some other distro." And so they had even threatened Fedora, like, "We'll just go over to Fedora." So Canonical backed down and said, "Okay, you know what? We're going to keep the 32-bit libraries there, so you'll still be able to use a lot of your applications." Fedora now has turned around and said, well, we're, we're going to drop it too. Like, it doesn't make sense to have it around. Uh, the the main area here that's weak is if you use things like Wine, the, the Windows emulator for Linux, uh, and I, I know people say it's not an emulator, but the E in Wine stands for emulator. Uh, so it, I, I think it's Wine is not an emulator is what yeah. it stands for, but if you look at the original <laughs> documentation, it says that it's an emulator. Uh, either way, it relies on those 32-bit libraries to function, and the moment those go away... It's hosed, it's broken, it doesn't work. So then you're left with having to run that software in a virtual machine, which honestly works just fine. So is is a viable option. Uh, you just have to be careful with those older OSs that aren't getting updated anymore because they become a security vulnerability. So so Windows Windows 10 is still has a 32-bit version, right? Yes. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe we'll well uh, we've got Microsoft Ignite coming up soon. Maybe we'll hear some announcements that they're dropping it too, and we'll. Well, with with Windows 10, like they only sell the 64-bit version. I don't think they sell the 32-bit version. I mean, you can get it through the developer site, but okay. they only sell the 64-bit. But their 64-bit version will still run 32-bit apps, uh, and it you know runs them in that backwards compatibility library, so it's able to do it. With these other OSs, when they remove that 32-bit functionality, you won't be able to run those apps. And I think the 32-bit Windows. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't those for specific devices like, so like lower end processors and, and stuff? Uh, where it's not a 64-bit architecture, or is it now it's all one binary and you're all good? I'm pretty sure it's all one now. I mean, I'd have to double check because like even your low-end stuff are still using 64-bit processors. It's not like, you know, if you go to Best Buy and find the cheapest laptop they sell, it's likely still a 64-bit processor because even the, you know, the cheap Pentium M's or whatever it is they put, uh, no, what are the ones they put in the really... Low end, the atoms, like the Intel atoms and stuff, they're sixty four bit. Yeah, I know the the atoms are. I think they still sell Celerons. Hmm. Um, I could be wrong about and, that. I'm, I'm you know, there are sixty four bit Celerons. So, yeah, I the the real challenge here are applications. So, if you have older applications that aren't being updated anymore, then they're not going to be compiled for sixty four bit. And if you lose that underlying subsystem, then they don't run anymore. Yeah, if there's some legacy thing you rely on for for your business, so just yeah, make sure that before you update uh, to Fedora or to uh, Catalina, it looks like. Uh, all right, our next article is over on Wired.com, an open source license that requires users to do no harm. Open source software can generally be freely copied and reused. One developer wants to impose ethical constraints on the practice. And and my big question is, so what? Because does anyone read the license? You just yeah. you click OK. <laughs> and you, they, they could have been asking this for years, and I have no idea. So this stems from a conversation that actually came about on Hacker News. And uh, what happened was there was an open source developer who found out that ICE was using his software. Uh, and ICE is the Immigration Customs Enforcement. Yes, there we go. Uh, thank you. I <laughs> kind of froze on that one. Uh, so anyhow, they're, uh, they're not, depending on which political party you lean towards, they're not uh, the most well-received governmental agency right now. So a lot of people are anti-ICE, uh, and this developer fell into that camp. And he said, you know what, I'm going to change my licensing agreement that says... If you uh, uh, work for ICE, you're not allowed to use this, right? So he's basically excluding people from this open source project, which technically makes it not open source anymore, right? So that created a whole debate. And so now they're looking to create some kind of open source license that basically says you're allowed to use this application as long as you're not doing harm to people. Now, 
In my opinion, this is extremely naive because what counts as do no harm? Yeah, that is now a subjective criteria well, yeah, to and some you, extent. If you ask, you know, the the ICE agent, of course, they're going to say, no, this is not doing harm. This is is doing my yeah. job and 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 protecting. And, and I remember reading about that. So he didn't change. So he was a large open source contributor. He didn't change one license. He went and changed all of his projects, including oh, ones one. that, uh, if we're talking about the same individual, mm -hmm. including ones that he hadn't really done anything with uh, for a while that other people were maintaining and he still had push rights he went and like overwrote commits and everything and people were like whoa hold up yeah uh he did end up reverting some of those back but it was a giant uproar and uh it was not only did he list ice he listed uh the governments that are part of these countries so he would list certain mm. governments wow. as well he was like you're not allowed to use these i'm like what what kind of Legal action are you going to take if they are? Also, does it matter retroactively if it was originally they used it under yeah. the other license and then you had like a, a backlash response and went, I've changed the license. Well, this this makes me wonder if this is symbolic, you know, for for his peace of mind as opposed to, it doesn't sound enforceable. I mean, it, it you know, we, we hear the, the example all the time about, um, you know, a wedding cake for a, for a gay marriage or something. And, and it, it, you know, there, there's still questions on which side, you know, that's on. So this seems like a, a court case waiting to happen if they say, no, you can't use this because you're, quote, doing harm, in my yeah. opinion. So how do you define that? I, if you want to have that kind of control over your product's reach, you can't go open source. Yeah, you, can, you, you just need close to source. source and control who you sell to. That's that's the way you do that. And you, you can't, th those two things don't mix together. So personally, uh, you know, the do no harm thing, I kind of feel like half the content on network television today does me harm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, this would really, yeah. really exclude a so ton of people. You can't use it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, Jersey Shore, that's like a weapon of mass destruction. Yeah, the CW can no longer <laughs> use this software. It's a whole, it's a whole mess. Yeah. Uh, all right, now let's head over uh, to a blog. This is Leah's blogs. Uh, Ken Thompson's Unix password. Great headline. Yeah, really. It it. it Gives you the you know the 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 story in essence there. All right, so th this is not a normal news article no, for us, not. but this came across a blog. I, I had a chance to to read the other day, and it was super entertaining, at least to me. And uh, Justin, you might appreciate this. Uh, so Unix, Unix is a super important operating system that came out of AT and T Bell Labs back in the nineteen seventies, and it is what led to Linux and the majority of everything we do on the internet today. Really, kind of comes about from the Unix operating system. And there's several big names that were involved in Unix and BSD in the early days. And these are people that are uh, considered celebrities in the in the, the Unix, Linux type world. Uh, and so it's people like Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, Brian Kernigan, Steve Bourne, Bill Joy. Like these are these are some of the founders, the original creators of uh, Unix and Linux. Well, I, I say Linux. You know, we always think Linus Torvalds, but Linux was designed to emulate a lot of what uh, Unix did. So. At any rate, what happened was uh, this blogger uh, a few years ago had been digging through an archive of the BSD3 source tree, and they came across a password file, a slash Etsy slash PASSWD file, uh, from a very, very old archive of BSD that contained user accounts for some of the original founders of Unix. And because it was all secured using DES, right, which is a very old uh, encryption algorithm, they knew they could break it. And they thought it would be fun to see like what passwords were the original creators of Unix using back then. And they were able to break all but one of them. And, and this is with weak encryption. They still weren't able to break one. And uh, they tried a couple of times over the years. And finally, just last week apparently, uh, they managed to break the last ones. Now we know all the passwords that the original Unix creators used. Uh, so for example, Brian Kernigan, he used slash dot comma slash dot comma. And that, that sounds weird, but if you look at your keyboard, those on, on a QWERTY keyboard in the U.S., they're right next to each other, so you can just tap, tap, and you know knock that out, and that was his password. That makes a little more sense. But the hard one was, uh, let me find it here, uh, P slash Q2 dash Q4 exclamation point. All right. Now, it's eight characters, which was a limitation of DES. So that's why it's only eight. Oh, it, wait, it's not all that stuff before? Oh, no, the that's, colon the, as that's well? the hashed version of it. Yeah. The, oh, yep. okay. And then the colon, and after that's the unhashed. Oh, password the, is, okay, gotcha. Yep. So uh, so what that is, the P slash Q2 dash Q4, is talking about pawn to queens two to queen uh, four. It's a chess move, and that particular uh, uh, person 
was known for writing computer chess and and so on. And so that, that last password was revealed. And so it was kind of fun to get a little insight into some of those people. When we say way back when, what, what are we talking about? Is this, are these from the, the 90s? No, this would have been, BSD3 would have been like mid-80s maybe? Mid-80s, okay. Yeah, yeah. So what's really crazy is, so th- this individual that wrote the blog, from, from what I'm understanding here, um, submitted this to the like a mailing list, and then someone was like, I found it out. And they took them four days on an AMD Radeon Vega 64 running Hashcat at 930 mega hashes per second. That, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, for that limited amount of characters, that's pretty good amount of time. I mean, obviously it's still four days and they figured it out, but that's not bad. Well, yeah. they were saying in here but that if it had been uppercase characters, it would have taken a 7-bit exhaustive search two years on a modern CPU. Yeah, and, and this is DES, which is considered like the weakest encryption algorithm. Yeah. So it does go to show that what, what we consider broken algorithms are still pretty strong. Yeah. You know, you've got to put some effort into it. Uh, and in this case, he just happened to use a series of characters that were uh, convoluted enough. And there were eight characters versus the, you know, the other password, the slash dot comma slash dot comma, that was only six characters. So it was weaker. This was eight characters. Uh, so you know, it does show that even weak encryption is sometimes still better than nothing. And and, it, and even even his mid '80s passwords are stronger than any of mine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> How would I ever remember that yeah. slash? Instead of an A, I'm using the et symbol. Oh. Mm. Mm-hmm. The secret's out. Yeah. <laughs> now we have now you know. An et symbol. Now you know. <laughs> uh, all right, let's head over now to the Chromium blog at blog.chromium.org. Chromium.org. Uh, no more mixed messages about HTTPS. And, I, you know, I, I've hated this, you know, just hearing it from both sides and, and not knowing which, you know, it's like when, when my parents fight. So what, <laughs> what, are, what are we finally settling on here? All right. So mixed messages, if you are a web developer or if you've ever supported a WordPress site or whatever, you've probably experienced this where you go to a website and you know it's secure. You typed in HTTPS, you know it's got a valid certificate. And then you get a warning that says some parts of this page are not secure, right? That's called a mixed content message. And it's warning you that while most of the page is using HTTPS is being served over a encrypted TLS tunnel, there are certain things on the page that aren't. Sometimes it ends up being the advertisements, and we don't care so much about that, but you don't really know. As an end user, you don't know which parts are secure and which parts aren't. So then browsers like Chrome will just flag the whole page as not being secure, right? So what's happening is Google is taking an extra step and making a change in the way that's handled. And the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna start call, or stop calling it out with a big message. And that they're just going to actively block the non-secure elements. So now when you go to a page that has mixed content, they will just render the secure stuff. Now, from my experience, what'll normally happen is somebody will write a page, it's secure, and in the page, they'll have a link to like a style sheet. And the link to the style sheet will be HTTP instead of HTTPS. So now you go to the page and it renders with no style sheet. So it's a giant mess on the screen and it's really not usable. So this change will break sites that do stuff like that. But in a later version, and remember they release a version every month. So when I say a later version, really just the next month. Uh, By February, the end result will be they're not going to warn you about mixed content. They're going to block non-secure elements. But before they block it, they're going to try and change the HTTP to HTTPS and see if it's available that way. Because maybe the style sheet or image element or whatever is available via secure connection, just they put the wrong protocol tag in there, right? And if that's the case, then it'll load properly and it'll work. Now, on a positive side, that means you get a secure page that works. On a negative side, if you're a developer and you made the mistake, it'll be harder for you to spot that you made a mistake because the browser is effectively inline patching that for you. But that'll be live in February of 2020, which is just, what, five months down the road. It's right around the corner. Are you ready? I, I, I try to make sure that all of my CDNs, everything is HTTPS because there are times during the development that things will go wonky if you have mixed content anyway. Yep. So like there's t- you're like, well, that didn't load right. Oh, it was mixed content and things go awry. Uh, so I try to make that very consistent because uh, actually you and I saw a page probably about a month ago where the whole page was flagged. And I was like, this is not secure. Yeah. Uh, had the, the little red X and everything. And it was because icons were being served from a CDN 
that was not HTTPS. Everything else on the page looked fine. Yeah, and, and with stuff that's on your server, you can use relative URLs, and that kind of solves it, right? Because if, if you access the page using HTTPS, everything else will use it because of the relative URLs. But when it's an asset stored on a different server, you can't use a relative URL, and that's where you've got to make sure that you flag it as secure. Sounds good. All right. Uh, let's head over, head over now to Tom's hardware. Uh, PDF encryption is busted. Adobe Acrobat, uh, Foxit, and others affected by security flaws. Um, so I've got this on my on my computer. Do I need to do I need to patch? Do I need to? No, no. This one's this this one's not a high risk, but I did want to talk about it a little bit because a, a lot of people. You ever go online and buy a PDF? Yep. Uh, and maybe it's oh, watermarked yeah, yeah. to your mm -hmm. name or whatever. So those PDFs are normally encrypted. And for me as the customer, I don't really care if it's encrypted, right? I just want to be able to read it. So if the encryption is busted in that document, I'm fine with that, right? Well, I mean, unless maybe it's my tax documents. Maybe I get my taxes done with H&R Block or something. They send me a PDF that's encrypted. I want it to stay encrypted. Well, what some researchers found was that the type of encryption that Adobe has defined inside of a PDF allows for you to select what gets encrypted. In other words, you don't have to encrypt, encrypt the entire PDF. You can encrypt just certain elements inside. And what they found was that that allowed them to modify the non-encrypted parts. So they could take an encrypted PDF. They can't read the, the encrypted data. They could then add uh, code. Like they, I think they were doing um, Python or something. They were able to add executable code to the non-encrypted parts so that the next time you opened that document, you were allowed to see it. You were allowed to decrypt it with your password, and then it would execute the code they had added and exfiltrate the data out yep. and and send it along. So you know that that's a it's a very difficult attack to pull off, and it requires them to have access to the files. But it also means that you should just be aware that PDFs are capable of running of executing. I think it's JavaScript, um, which is you know some of those nice features where it goes. Do you want to send this over here or sign this? That's code executing. But if you want to keep that secret, you don't want that just arbitrary. It's more or less like a macro. Well, that, right. And that seems scarier to me. You know, is that is that something that can be used in, in other ways to to put code on, on my machine? It could, yeah. Well, and, and that's where, like, if you're running uh, antivirus on your system, it's looking for behaviors like that. Okay. You know, a PDF shouldn't be accessing areas of your file system or, or whatever. And at the end of the day, the PDF should be running under your user context anyway when it's being rendered and that code executes. So... That's stuff that we kind of have to trust them to provide security for. I'll tell you, Adobe has not done a great job with that. Uh, Foxit, they've got a pretty decent track record. I actually use the Foxit reader on uh, some of my systems. But uh, at the end of the day, this one is actually a flaw in the document itself. Like when Adobe introduced document encryption, they should have encrypted the entire document, not just certain elements inside of it. So I'm not sure why they made that decision. Yeah, I was wondering, what, what was the, look, well, we only need to encrypt these two paragraphs. I feel like this should be an all or nothing thing. They, they probably wanted it where you could like read metadata off of the document. Uh, so, you know, who is the author? I can't see what's in it, but I know who the author is so I can reach out to them. It, it's probably something of that nature, but still you, you know, with security, you got to make a choice. Okay, so so not really concerning for people that uh, consume PDFs, but if you are a, a publisher that maybe um, uses this to sell your ebook or, or something like that, that that would right. be yeah. um, something that would concern you. Okay. Uh, all right, we're going to go to Forbes.com now for our next article. Uh, warning for Windows users as encryption breaking malware breaks cover. Okay, so that's a, that's a little bit of a tongue twister. So yeah. we're saying the malware that breaks encryption breaks cover? All right, so yes, okay. yes, that is correct. Uh, and when I, when I skimmed this headline originally, I thought it meant one thing, and it turned out to be something entirely different. Uh, what I assumed was that this would be some kind of malware that created a proxy, so that when you were browsing to secure websites, you'd actually be going through the proxy and it would be able to see everything that you were doing. Well, activity like that can be detected. So I, I wasn't like this wasn't like a big red flag for me, but I read the article and uh, and sure enough, they've actually found something even better. This is not a proxy based malware. And in fact, it doesn't modify your traffic in any way, which makes this incredibly difficult to detect. And what they did is something really, really interesting. Uh, they basically created malware that targets the random number generator in your operating system. Uh, and this one is focused on Windows. And so it goes in and, you know, every every system has a uh, PRNG, right? A programmatic random number generator. I think that's what that stands for. Uh, 
Either way, uh, it, it's I'll what your computer it. uses to generate random numbers. Well, when it picks a random number, it needs entropy. It needs a, a bunch of just junky data to be able to create random numbers because computers can't really pick a random number. There was a famous XKCD cartoon about that, like, uh, you know, where he wrote a program. It says, pick a random number, random number equals four. So it <laughs> always equaled four. Yeah. But you couldn't argue that it wasn't random because maybe it just randomly picked four a hundred time. times in a yeah. row. We don't know, right? It's hard That's to prove just randomness. statistics. Right. So uh, uh, so in this case, they compromise the RNG. So when your system goes to generate random data, it was actually generating consistent data, which meant they could then predict what the private key would be used for that session, and then they could decode that data without modifying it. So this malware is actually able to intercept the traffic and read it and even write to it if it wanted because it can calculate out what the private key would be based on the conditions the system had. Now, this does require your system to be like full-blown compromised. So, you know, the malware has to be installed and it has to have elevated access to your system. But if it can do that, which is a number of like remote access toolkits and things that allow people to do that, once they've made that step, then they can compromise the RNG. And from there, they've got access to your data. Pseudo random number generator. Oh, P yeah. for pseudo. Yeah. yeah, P for pseudo. There we go. Uh, oh, but I, 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 will, I think I think programmatic because technically the pseudo random number generator or deterministic random bit generator is an algorithm. So, and it's going to be accessed by programming language. So it's kind of programmatic anyway. And you always put that qualifier for random numbers when it comes to computers because it's not actually random. It's not like you picked a. Uh, an atom out of the universe at random. Or well, anything we use. Like that. I'm, I'm distracting Justin because I'm, I'm reaching back to my desk. You know, we've talked about random numbers before because random number generators and computers are susceptible to not having good entropy, and there have been a few exploits over the years. And so people do things like, like what I'm trying to show you here, which is this is a hardware entropy device that I you can stick onto a computer. If you're doing like virtual machines, virtual machines suck at generating random numbers. And so uh, like Intel is starting to build hardware into their processors that you can rely on. But people can add devices like this to serve as that source. And this is far more difficult to subjugate. I mean, if somebody was to attack this, they would have to attack the driver for it to be able to compromise it. But it gives you a much cleaner source of that entropy. What's that? And what's that called? Uh, so... The one I actually use is actually in the back of my server back there. It's called a bit babbler. Okay. And the bit babbler's sole job is generating that entropy. Uh, this one is called uh, One RNG. I don't I don't recommend this one. That's why it's sitting in my drawer. Well, and we talked to that company a while back, Whitewood, um, that used light, right? They used. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they they would track the path of a photon, which mm -hmm. is truly random, mm -hmm. uh, to generate that entropy, uh, which they. Uh, uh, it's a little mysterious what happened to that company. Cause yeah. I, uh, it's kind of fallen off the face of the earth. Everybody who's there works for Amazon now, mm. but I can't get confirmation that Amazon acquired them. And it certainly appears that way, but then they kept it under wraps. So maybe Amazon doesn't want people knowing how they're generating that entropy yeah, for sure. their data centers. But yeah, because that, that rolled out of Los Alamos National Labs. Right. Yeah, I there's no way they went out of business. Like That no. product was yeah, awesome. That was cool. So they, uh, they, they got acquired. It's just not public data. And it's probably because it's a security Sure. product. Makes yeah. sense. Uh, all right, let's head over now for our last article at threatpost.com. D-Link home routers open to remote takeover will remain unpatched. And th well, that just seems dumb. Yeah, we can stick this one in the Foscam bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have one of these also, Peter? This, this is, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've hardwired my Foscam yeah. directly <laughs> into the It's actually duct taped together in yeah. your house. Is that wrong? Isn't it? I put well, it in my backpack or my, my messenger bag with, with my, your Azure box. My, yeah. my AWS is in my messenger bag. That way you can extend it to the cloud when you get back to the mm -hmm. office. Sure. So, uh, you know, we've had a couple instances of this over the last year, and I think we're going to start seeing this more and more, where there are devices that are fully compromised or have well-documented backdoors, have hard-coded private keys, and so on, that the vendors are no longer supporting and not releasing a firmware update. And in that scenario, that device is just permanently compromised. And we can add a current D-Link router. I, I shouldn't say current. This is not sold on the shelf at like Best Buy right now, but as of a year ago, it was, and you can still buy it from third-party marketplaces. Uh, so there's four or five different D-Link router models that all have a, a CVE on them, CVE 2019-16920, and there's not going to be a forthcoming firmware, and it doesn't support OpenWRT or even third-party firmwares because this one used a crazy uh, chipset on it. But either way, uh, it's compromised. So if you have that device that is in that model or in that range, 
it's time to replace it. Yep. And this is probably one of those scenarios where the type of people um, listening to this podcast don't have uh, something that's compromised. But uh, we're coming up on, on Thanksgiving, so when you do go home and your uh, grandmother asks you to, to take a look at the computer, just, just check if that's a, a D-Link router up there and if it falls under one of those uh, uh, those compromised ones. Yeah. Or if you're looking for a discount router, I bet these will be cheap on eBay in a couple sure. of weeks. Yeah. Uh, but they they are vulnerable to a command injection. So, yeah. <laughs> that, well, that's the other way to go. As opposed to uh, you know helping people out at Thanksgiving, great Christmas gifts to give uh, to your enemies. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know you can probably pick these up on the cheap. Yeah. And hey, you bundle uh, this with a Foss cam. I hear that's a top notch. Yeah. Gift. And just tell them, hey, <laughs> just want want you have that that home automation and security, <laughs> and I want to keep tabs on you. Uh, yes. If and you also, were... I need botnets to sell on the dark net. <laughs> <laughs> If you were to stick a firewall in front of this, it would be relatively safe. I mean, it'd still be attackable from the inside. But if you're going to go through the lengths of sticking a firewall in front of it, you might as well just buy a new router. Yeah, you pro. It's probably a little cheaper to get a new yeah. router at that point. Uh, hey guys, it's time uh, hey. for our interview. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna uh, see if we can uh, get a connection all the way to Scandinavia, which is, I think that's in. In Sweden, right? I think it's in Asgard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, Joachim Sundberg, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Baffin Bay Networks. Uh, we're going to talk about threat protection and the solutions they have to offer. So let's get to that right after this on TechNATO. Are you a career changer or a budding tech pro who's looking to start their career in IT? I'm Wes Bryan, and along with my fellow IT Pro TV edutainer, Cherokee Boos, we've just shot a new show just for you. Each week, we'll dive into topics to help you launch your career in tech. Watch how to get started in IT on YouTube now. Just head to youtube.com forward slash IT Pro TV to watch and look for new episodes every Saturday at 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. All right, welcome back to TechNATO, and we're joined by our guests now all the way over in Sweden. We have Joachim Sundberg, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Baffin Bay Networks. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. And you? Uh, I'm great, thank you, and thank you for joining us with the, the time difference and everything. So, uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's nice to have you on, and the connection looks great for being across the Atlantic. So uh, thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, I want to just first uh, kind of understand a little bit about what uh, what Baffin Bay Networks does. I I read all these uh, this website descriptions about security and things, and I don't know. You know, are are you a a software product? Are you a consulting company? Kind of give us a little bit of background about what it is you guys do. Sure. So we uh, build and operate a cloud native threat protection platform. Um, so in other words, we protect customers in real time uh, against volumetric DDoS attacks, low and slow type of DDoS attacks, but also additional things on layer seven, like uh, bot protection, web application firewall, IPS capabilities, and application performance. Do you have any? So, uh, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, no. So that, that's basically what we do. Uh, require no hardware. Uh, it's a subscription from a from a customer perspective. So, yeah. what? Well, uh, who are those customers? Is is it uh, governments, large enterprises, small business? Where do you fit in there? Uh, we really have uh, customers from all the way down to two users and an app uh, up to big, big banks in Europe. Uh, so mostly our customers is focused around Europe. Um, we do have uh, customers over in the US as well, uh, but the majority of customers sits in, in Europe and Middle East and, and Africa region. Uh, but uh, it's everything from small uh, small. Uh, Corporates with a or small companies with a with a with an app uh, up to uh, big uh, banks and and IRS uh, in different countries and and insurance companies and so on. No, I I know a little bit about your background. I, I did a bit of cyber stalking earlier. So <laughs> you know you you've worked with F five and and Sourcefire and Juniper. So some of the big players in the security space. What. What made you want to go off and, and, and do your own? Is there something that you're doing differently that is more effective than what the bigger players are doing? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that was one of the, the, the reasons for funding uh, Buffin Bay was really the challenge uh, we saw with existing cloud native or cloud based scrubbing uh, solutions, uh, which was mostly focused on, on volumetric DDoS layer 3, layer 4. Uh, everyone knows that. In, in, mo in many cases, big 
uh, DDoS attacks are smoke screens for uh, more sophisticated attacks that tries to use a, or exploit a vulnerability on layer seven in a web application or a vulnerability on the web server. So it's really handy to throw some uh, some DDoS traffic against it uh, at the same time to make sure people focus on the wrong thing. So that, that was one of the um, drives in terms of how we built our platform that we call uh, a single pass platform, which means that we take in traffic, we decode, normalize, uh, analyze it module by module, depending on what the customer has turned on. Uh, but it's uh, it, it's not being decoded or sent around on the internet. Uh, all the modules are cooperating with, with each another. Uh, so it's kind of a nerve system behind the scenes that shares the information. Uh, and that goes with uh, mitigation as well. Uh, so if we figure out that it's more performance-wise better to mitigate it on layer 3, uh, so IP layer, then do it on layer 7. Once we discover something on layer 7, we can actually push down mitigation uh, to layer 3. Um, so we try to, to make the best use of the hardware as well as the software from that perspective, both from an from a detection perspective, but also from a mitigation perspective. Uh, the second drive behind this was uh, MSSPs. There were no existing platforms today that allowed an MSSP or a managed security service provider uh, to opt into service and sell them sell that in their name with their brand logo uh, and coloring schema. Uh, but there were a big need for it. There was a huge drive for it and, and lots of asks for it. So uh, that was something we did from the beginning. We built uh, our threat protection platform, ground up uh, with the MSSPs in mind. So we can scale sales and allow them to use the tool and, and yeah, pull in their own customers and, and take first line support and you know, get going. Hey. You mentioned modules earlier. Does that mean you you focus on protecting certain types of applications, or can you handle custom applications? Uh, we can handle custom applications in the sense of, uh, I mean, web applications are custom applications using common protocol. Uh, we have common support or support for uh, for for common TCP and UDP, uh, and to that we can apply. Uh, IPS capabilities, we can apply threat intel capabilities and, and DDoS mitigation. Uh, so it doesn't have to be uh, doesn't have to be uh, an application we know about. Uh, but for it, for us to be able to intercept, decrypt, uh, and inspect payload, uh, we we need to uh, see that traffic being HTTP or HTTPS and HTTP two uh, to be able to do that. All right, I'm going to turn this a little self-serving today because uh, so our, our our day job is with IT Pro TV and uh, you know we we deliver training content all over the world and a lot of that is security related training content. So our website is um, it, it's constantly under attack, <laughs> not, not usually by malicious people, just by our own students trying to test things out and yeah. it's uh, yeah. it's it's fun. In the in the early days of our company, we we ran WordPress. And we found that there were tons of different services out there that would protect WordPress. It was, it was easy to find a, a WAF or, or a solution like that. But when we made the jump over to having our own custom-written web application, so our, our entire LMS is in-house built, all of a sudden mm -hmm. the, the available players in that space became really small. And we ended up going with um, uh, a competitor of yours, uh, Encapsula, or the, the company's actually in Perva, uh, who, who's you know ranked really highly in all the various scores for doing a good WAF. But... Mm -hmm. What we yeah. found is they don't really understand custom web applications. So it's very mm -hmm. manual. We're having to manually go in and put in rules and tell it about our application. Uh, do you work the same way or are you able to like, I, I know you mentioned that uh, uh, you have some kind of artificial intelligence or, or ways of being able to analyze an app and learn and become dynamic. That's something I'm not finding in your competitors. So is, is that something you guys have, yeah. have specialized in? Yeah, absolutely. And and that, that was also obviously one of the challenge. I mean, Going going to the cloud, you do that for a reason. Either because you want to follow your applications and you don't have uh, the possibility to put hardware in front of AWS. Uh, another big reason for it is that you don't want to spend the amount of time it takes to tune uh, a web application firewall, for example, or an IPS uh, to uh, generate meaningful alarms and not block the wrong wrong sort of traffic. Um, so we have a uh, autopilot mode, uh, which is. Uh, where the modules goes and learn, in this case, if it's a web application and you turn on web application firewalling, uh, it goes and learns the application. Uh, everything from the language of the application, uh, is it UTF-8 or something else? Uh, based on that, 
it starts to apply the right set of signatures. It looks as the, it also looks at the technology being used. So jQuery being used, what's known from, from a vulnerability perspective in, in that specific version. So it goes and try to figure out all that out and, and apply the right set of mitigation to it. Uh, another important thing is the parameters and, and the URIs that you can actually pass parameters to, uh, the length of them, uh, the, the character sets, and so on. So it starts learning that from day one uh, and continuously evolving once you do changes to the, uh, to the web application uh, as well. So yeah, that is a big important thing. Now, I know you guys are a, well, actually, I don't know. How long have you been in business? Uh, so we officially started uh, beginning of 2017. Uh, okay. We did we did some development before that, but uh, that's the official date when we get seed capital uh, from our business angels. So you've been going for a couple of years now, and I know with with security services, a lot of people are hesitant to trust a brand new product. You know, you want to wait for it to be proven in the industry and that it's it's shown its worth. Uh, mm -hmm. How have you guys been doing it? Has the reception reception been good? Have you been making a lot of great traction? Yeah, so we have, uh, so in November now, we've been in production with the platform for two years. Uh, we have not lost a single customer over two years. We protect about 240 different uh, uh, web services today or services today. Um, again, spanning from very, very small companies to extremely big companies. Uh, but yeah, we, we felt that. Uh, it's uh, starting a new cybersecurity company is, is is, is I mean, it's, it's not like starting an app company and coming out with a uh, with a consumer product. It's very conservative from that perspective. You need to prove yourself. You need to done a number of uh, independent test reports and those kind of things. So we, we've seen that over the last two years. But uh, for us now, it's really over the last four five months. It started to uh, starting to see a bit of the catch up effect. Uh, so customers we've been speaking to for a very long time uh, coming back now and saying, hey, well, the competitor didn't really work. Uh, can we try out your solution? Yeah, it sounds like Don's ready to buy, so we'll uh, we'll get the credit card information <laughs> offline. But uh, so I'm curious. You've mentioned a couple of times that you you know work with small businesses and all the way up to to large banks and enterprises. Uh, do they have different needs? I would think that that uh, you know maybe something wouldn't be one size fits all that that would fit uh, right. both of those kinds of businesses. So so do you find that everybody every business that's online has the same uh, core issues that they have to to deal with, and and then you kind of customize from there. I think so, yeah, uh, but it, the multiplayer becomes, I mean, obviously uh, bigger, uh, the bigger company uh, that we protect. Uh, take one thing, for example, you, you've seen it on the website, something called Threat Insight, which is data from our global sensor network uh, about every single IP on the internet. We use that data uh, in the threat data lake to create something we call uh, threat feeds. Those threat feeds can be used in our platform, and you can actually select based on categories what you want to allow and don't allow. Um, and that's sort of removing the daily noise of traffic. Uh, and if you are a big company with 10, maybe 10 prefixes slash 24 is routed through us, uh, if we can strip away the daily noise, the return traffic, uh, amount of the return traffic from the web server uh, goes down significantly. Uh, whereas if you're a smaller company, you don't have the same multiplier effect. Um, and uh, we see that some companies has more need for bot protection and usually bot protection are like if you look in, into insurance companies in gaming and gambling uh, bot protection is is key and, and really really sensitive or like a key component uh, we have uh, one customer being one of the biggest sports books in the world uh, providing uh, odds for all the big uh, gambling uh, sites uh, their API is public. It's a public API. Uh, and they want to have it that way. But they want to make sure that there is no bots scraping the APIs for odds uh, and using that uh, for setting up uh, fake sites, for example. So yeah, it, it varies. But I mean, the base protection is the same. The use, usage of the product from a portal perspective, logging on, be able to be part of the configuration if you wish to, or put it into autopilot, uh, but also see exactly what happens, uh, what sort of DDoS attacks are occurring, where does it originate from, what sort of web application attacks are occurring, what type of bots are we blocking, and those kind of things. Those, those are the same. So having such kind of a, a wide, varied customer base, uh, 
I'm just wondering, has has there been an instance where you went, we caught that. That is amazing. I'm so happy that this worked. Like, I blocked this traffic. Is there one that really stands out in your mind uh, that you were successful at? Or is it just like, oh, no, we, we got this on lock? We, I, I, I think a big aha moment for me was about three months back, two months back. Uh, we had a huge distributed denial of service attack towards uh, uh, the European internet exchange. Uh, and um, that attack originated for several thousand IPs. Uh, we just came online with Threat Insight, which is our intelligence or Threat Insight or Threat Intelligence platform, uh, and started to use that in the, in the product, in the Threat Protection Service. Uh, we went back uh, and had a look at the attack when it occurred and how it was blocking. And we could see that we had close to 100% coverage of the IPs being part of the attack in Threat Insight. Um, and I think moving forward, that's going to be really important because we can craft really, really good feed lists where we can be more efficient in terms of blocking because we know that the IP addresses are bad before we actually have to decode the package, look at the uh, TCP header information, or even sample the data and, and run it through our algorithms. We actually know it based on the IP address. This is a bad IP, has done nothing good on the internet. And the activity indicator is really high. So we see that being an active IP right now. Um, and I think that that was, uh, that, that was a big aha moment for me, feeling that, yeah, the time we spent on, on developing that and pushing out several thousand sensors on the internet um, and try to put them in smart places where we could see as much data as possible. Uh, that was a that was a big thing. That's great, and and you're rarely in the news uh, in this industry uh, for you know for things going well. <laughs> so that, that's good to <laughs> yeah. uh, to have that that kind of moment. Um, so uh, yeah, we and we checked our our IP addresses here earlier on the uh, the thread insight on your on your website, and and thankfully everything was clear. But if, <laughs> if other people want to go and, and check that out, where can they find that? So you can uh, you can go to buffinbaynetworks.com. Uh, and there is a link called Threat Insight. Um, so that that is a that is a public available service, and you can start searching uh, when you hit your uh, allowed searches per day from that IP address. You just uh, log on using your Google credentials or other type of credentials, uh, and we unlock another one thousand searches per month for you. Um, we're coming up with a with a packaged format of, of queries and integration with uh, Sim solutions, so we can enrich and, and also do noise reduction uh, when you look at uh, events and, and activities from, a, from in a Sim like Splunk or something else. Uh, we we can actually enrich that view and give you a bit more in terms of what that IP address has done elsewhere. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much again for for taking the time with us today. I, you know, I know it's uh, a little later in the day for you there, so uh, it's good, it's good to get our our schedules yeah. together and get you on here. But and I know I know Don will probably be reaching out soon and, uh, <laughs> and get, getting a demo here. But uh, I hope so. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for taking the time, and uh, thank you all for watching. But stay tuned because we have more Technado coming up right after this. I'm James Packer. I'm the general manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, it helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training. And last year alone, they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV, I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. All right, welcome back to Technado, and it wasn't only a great interview, but uh, you know, a great time saver for Don, who was able to I know. demo new software that uh, that we need here. At the the podcast is now our R and D department. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like I think for the podcast, we need a demo of that uh, software, so we can speak to it more intelligently. Yeah.
Makes a lot of sense, but uh, yeah, might be something we see in the arsenal here soon. So uh, thank you to Joachim for taking the time today. I uh, want to let you know about a couple of things before we let you go. Uh, it's webinar time again. Uh, if you head over to itpro.tv slash webinars, you can see all of the past webinars, all the upcoming ones. We just had one on end of life for Windows 7. Is your organization prepared? Uh, so that'll be going into the archive very soon where you can still access it. Uh, but we have a fun one coming up actually on Halloween on Thursday, October October 31st at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Threats in Disguise. Are you haunted by hidden hacker hardware? So uh, Don is doing that with Daniel, and we'll be talking about all kinds of uh, kind of pen testing tools and the things that you might find uh, on your network uh, that uh, that are out of place but don't seem out of place. So, And we've talked about before, you know, uh, network adapters that are actually land turtles or, you know, all, all those kinds of things. So that should be fun, and we'll have uh, have a little fun with that. And I think we've got some some hoodie giveaways um, as we are, uh, you know, hacker equal hoodies. So we will be giving those away as well. Uh, also, if you're interested in finding out more about IT Pro TV, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado. Uh, we've got a 30% off coupon code for you there uh, for the lifetime of your account. Uh, you can also sign up for a seven-day free trial, and you can request a demo uh, for... Uh, your team if you have uh, a business account uh, with more than one person and you can see all the uh, fun things that go along with that so that's go.itpro.tv slash technado all right thank you gentlemen i just want to let you know you're both connected to a wi-fi hotspot that's hidden in my beard (laughs) yeah you'll ne- you never suspected it yeah, yeah i you know the webinar hasn't happened yet so i, I wouldn't know but after the webinar yeah that's actually why i have the the gauged out ears they're batteries oh. yeah that's how i run them actually i kind of want to make that now yeah that i made that joke <laughs> i want to make like, a what would I need to have like little batteries well, i can like, get you a- what are you doing you're on justin net yeah i can yeah. get you a d-link router uh on the oh cheap, yeah so yeah. we could start there yeah maybe we can get them cheap on eBay. Maybe I hear they're it. easy to configure because you can just command inject. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and somehow my beard's on fire. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, uh, <laughs> your skin is even more red than normal. <laughs> uh oh, Justin. So, uh, uh, all right. Well, uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll work on that next week. But uh, that's going to do it for this episode. So we'll see you next week right here on Tech NATO.